All right, so today we're going to talk about community interactions. The idea of community is a whole bunch of populations that live together in the same place and interact. So we say, you know, interactions, right? That they're having uh, relations with each other in some way. It could be for food, space. Sometimes there's jobs like all the photosynthesizers are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They're using oxygen. They're, they're using carbon dioxide, excuse me. All of the photosynthesizers are using carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight to produce food for everyone else in the ecosystem. So here's a place where you have different species who are being relied upon by all the other species. Populations are the same species who live in the same place at the same time, and they can potentially interbreed. What that means is that they can have sex with each other and have fertile offspring. So now we've got populations. So we've got populations, and we've got other populations and other populations, and then they're going to interact. That's community. How the living things interact with one another. <clears throat> so ecosystems, if you remember the term ecosystem means the way the living things interact with the non-living things, the biotic, interact with the abiotic in a specific space. That's an ecosystem. Today, we're going to focus on the living things, the communities within. You cannot survive as a species without interacting with another species. So as the example I just gave you, that all living things rely on producers to get their food from them, all living things, or all producers, I should say, rely on the decomposers and the detritivores to break down all of the leftover nutrients or atoms in dead things and the waste of things so that they can rebuild themselves. So right now in the fall, as we are going to see soon enough when the weather changes a bit more and the leaves fall, all of the nutrients, the atoms, within the leaves are going to go to the ground and the detritivores and the decomposers are going to break apart any energy left and they're going to break the bonds between the atoms and then those atoms are going to be available in the ground so that in the spring we have those remember when we are on this yearly cycle of optimal 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 conditions in the spring one of those optimal conditions is that you have a lot of nutrients in the ground so that when the water weather gets warmer the plants can the roots can take up those nutrients and begin to regrow the plants it's a very important other part of just examples of reliance between some species with other species in the ecosystem so we all need other species to survive that balance how well do you survive is that balance between biotic potential, the growth of a population, and then when conditions become tighter, you have competition, you have predators, you have diseases, you have competition for space, food, water, light, nutrients. And so we have that interaction of the growth, the optimal growth of a population being hindered or stopped or slowed down by environmental resi resistance. So let's remember again, biotic, that term biotic means life, bio, life, living things. So anything that we call a biotic factor are living things. And it could be animals, it could be microbes, plants, or even humans. And abiotic, that term a means no or without. And then you have life bio again. So abiotic factors are non-living things, but we certainly rely on those non-living things as well, as I just mentioned. If we're talking about like, I don't even have sunlight on here, but sunlight, water, wind blowing things, temperature, uh, just natural systems at play, and even rocks, the nutrients that are within rocks and soil. So we have that balance in an ecosystem or we have that reliance, not only living things with other living things, but living things with non-living things in an ecosystem. And the fueling of the relationships between living things and living things are often 
due to the non-living things like photosynthesis, right? We've got carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, all abiotic factors. That those abiotic factors are going to fuel the producers or the photosynthesizers to provide to everyone else in the ecosystem. So even if we're today just looking at community interactions, we also have to remember that those community interactions, the interaction between all the living things in environment are based also with the availability of the non-living things as well. So they're kind of like an underlying factor in there. If anything in this ecosystem is disrupted, we may see widespread problems. So a nice, easy example to think about is if you have drought in an area. With drought, you have a lack of water. So you might have in an area a ton of sunlight and a ton of carbon dioxide, but if you're missing that third thing for photosynthesis, water, then you're not gonna have enough food and then everybody else is gonna suffer. So any disruption, and we're seeing again, I know I mentioned climate change a lot because we're daily, right? Hurricanes going on right now. One of potentially the worst hurricanes we will ever see. Ooh, so every day we hear something new, right? Forget about the Maui already, right? It's kind of like, oh yeah, that, that seems like it was a long time ago, it was two weeks ago. So we're having these natural disasters like we've never seen before. Humans have a big factor in disrupting ecosystems. And one example that I like to use are lionfish. Lionfish are a species of fish that are found in the Indo-Pacific, so on the other side of the world. We're seeing a huge outbreak of these fish in the Caribbean. They're not natural or endemic to the Caribbean. But some of the features about them that makes them disruptive is that lionfish have poisonous spines. So nobody wants to get near them. Predators don't want to get near them because, one, they have spines. That would hurt. If you ate them, right, you get stuck in the throat. But the other thing is those poisonous spines emit a poison or release a poison that paralyzes the cells in that area and then the blood picks up that poison and then starts to paralyze the rest of the body and the brain. And so you see huge neurological issues as well as just major uh, paralyzation. The other thing about lionfish that's really unique is that they have a really big mouth for their size. So their mouth goes from about there to there. And what they can do is they can extend their mouth out and then they have a very strong suction ability. So they can just see an area that has a bunch of juvenile species and just go up and go and they can eat as many as they can hold in their stomachs and they have a very large stomach as well. So what, one of the hugest factors is, or I should say two huge factors in them being destructive is that there's not a lot of species or higher predators that want to eat them. So they can just multiply and multiply and they can eat up juveniles like that. And if they're eating all the juveniles, remember those life growth charts. If you don't have anybody in the pre-reproductive years to move up to reproductive years, how do you keep a population going? It's very difficult. Okay, you're probably going like, well, what do humans have to do with this? So there's a lot of hypotheses about how lionfish got from the Indo-Pacific over to this area of the world. And one of the original hypotheses, which to me seems very preposterous, was that because they're so beautiful, a lot of people want to keep them in their home aquariums. And they hypothesized that people would grow them and then they'd get too big for their tanks and then they'd dump them into the ocean and then they started to reproduce. But What's the likelihood that a fertile male and a fertile female were dumped in the same like, distinct area and then they mated and then they started this biotic potential of exponential growth? That would also mean that if you have like one or two mating pairs, the genetics are not very different and so the chances of survival are very slim and also just the chances of survival. We talked about fish 
as a type three survivorship curve that they pump out a lot of babies but not a lot survive to old age. And so you've got a lot of factors that is like, well, if you have a few or a very small population of these from people dumping them in the ocean, the, the chances of them like having this great biotic potential are very slim. But we get a lot of stuff from the other side of the world. And the way that we get that stuff, and it's so cheap now, stuff is just so cheap. All of these websites, you can order stuff for a dollar, 50 cents, comes from the other side of the world. How does it get to you? Well, there's huge ships. So these ships are blocks long. If you've ever been to a seaport and you see those giant ships and they've got the train containers, the metal train containers on them, and they may not look that big, but if you start to think about a train that has one of those boxes on them, the box car they're called, and the size of them are probably like two car lengths. Now you look at these big ships and they've got they're just packed, right? And then they're packed five or six or eight tall. And so now you've got tons and tons and tons of these. So what they're carrying are tons of these. And so they might look small, these all like look small from far away, but that means this is huge. These ships, the way that they usually get from like one area of water to the next, and areas of water can be differing heights. So on land, the land will often, where they come into the port, they'll lower them down to match the shipping port. And we know like, with climate change that seas are rising. So these little locks that they go through, that here's the ocean water, and then the lock, because the port is lower than the ocean water, they have to go into this lock, they get lowered down. So they go into this lock, this gate opens, they get lowered down, this gate closes, this gate opens, and then they come through. And so the ships actually go lower. If you've ever been to like one of those little boat things, out on Lake Michigan, that happens, right? You go through, to get to, from the lake to the river, you go through this thing where you go lower to get to the river. So that's a lock. So you have to also have a balancing of this, and they have what's called ballast water inside. And when they go through the locks, this ballast water will go up or it will go down. And there's huge outlets that will allow this water in and out. So that when it goes through the lock, it may release water into that area or it might take up water, depending on when it's going in or out, to make sure that this is well balanced and it doesn't just fall over. So when it's in the Indo-Pacific, it will take in water as it's going from the lock or from the shipping dock, goes into the lock and it takes water in so that when it gets to the ocean, it's more balanced. So they're taking in water from that area. Do you think maybe some fish might get into that ballast water? Yeah, so a lot of species will, if they're around there, which they often are, um, a lot of these areas that have docks, they will have, uh, stuff in the ocean will grow on anything. And so, um, you might have in an area where ever you park the boat, if you go under the water and you look at the poles of that dock, you've got entire ecosystems on those docks. And so they get sucked into the ballast water. And so species like this from across the world come over to our side of the world and then the ballast water goes out and there they are. And so that's probably how they've gotten here. What we call them is we call them invasive or introduced species. That they go from one area of the world and then they're introduced or they invade an area of the world where they are not natural. So believe it or not, there's predators 
of lionfish in the Indo-Pacific. There are higher animals like sharks and eels and groupers that have adapted to eating them. But on our side of the world, they're like, we don't, we don't, the sharks and the groupers and the um, eels are like, we don't know what this is. So they kind of look at it and they're like, that looks scary. And they go and eat their natural food. So when one of these introduced species comes into a new area, all the predators go, I don't know what that is. And the predators just focus on their natural food sources. And so that allows a species like this to have very little environmental resistance and great biotic potential. And we've seen them grow to these large population numbers in the Caribbean. And they are destructors. They're sucking everything up. So that's human cause, right? And it might not be intentionally human cause, because I don't think anybody intends, like, let's take these species and put them on the other side of the world and doing the shipping. It just is a cause of human interactions. So sometimes humans may intentionally take an invasive species or an introduced species and bring it from one area of the world to the other, or it may be unintentional through just humans living their own lives. Another example is purple loosestrife. I always drive down, I come up LaGrange Road from the north and I drive down 107th and I see this. You can see some, it's not very much on the roadsides over here, but in some areas in the southwest, forest preserves and just on roadsides, you'll see a ton of this where it's like very green and then you see these whorls of purple, pretty purple flowers. So back in the 1800s, what some people did is they came from Europe to here, they were looking at wetlands here and they were like, they're not very colorful. You know, we've got like cattails and you've got um, reed grass and it's all very like brown and green. And they're like, let's introduce some color to these wetlands. So they started planting purple loosestrife. And it is very pretty, right? It adds a little nice pop of purple, but again, no natural predators, no competition and it starts to invade the space of the natural species and what can happen over time, because there are no natural predators for this particular plant, that the other plants are getting eaten at, eaten at a balanced rate, but they're just like popping up everywhere. And then they start to overcrowd all of the natural species and they dominate an area. So you can see sometimes, because of that lack of natural predators and the very little competition, that you can start to have like whole wetlands that are just purple loosestrife. So one of the things to think about in terms of these invasive species coming into an area and beginning to dominate or become the predominant species in that area is that it lowers the availability of all the other nutrients or food sources. So think about this. So tell me yes or no. Eating oranges is healthy. Yeah, right, so fruit good source of vitamin C and other nutrients. Eating only oranges is healthy. Okay, so that's like what happens with these invasive species, is that you have something that might have great nutrients in it, but is it good to eat for all of the animals and the microbes and the protists in that area? Is it good for them to only eat that one species? No. So you want a variety or a diversity of species in an area because it makes everybody else healthier. And when you do have just one starts to dominate that area, that's not healthy for everybody else. So we have these issues. And so like, for example, here, beautiful, right? Really pretty, not healthy for that ecosystem. This has taken over. So these invasive species or introduced species can disrupt the ecosystem because again, nobody's eating them. They're like, what, I don't know. I worked on a study um, right after graduate school on purple loosestrife with the um, University of Illinois. And they started to have, they had us introduce these beetles to the areas where there was purple loosestrife. So we would get these vials and we would sprinkle the beetles onto the purple loosestrife. And that was one of their natural predators from Europe. But then our next question was, what happens when the beetles eat all the purple loosestrife? And now you have purple loosestrife goes down, but the beetle population's out of control. And they're like, well, we haven't gotten there yet. Like, well, 
that might be something to think about. Um, so they can it just increase exponentially, show really great biotic potential here. So increase, spread, you can see this is out of control. When you have an area that's dominated by one species, it might look good, but that's not good for the ecosystem. And some people, so, so that could change, like I said, the whole structure of the community, right? Having only eating, having to eat only one species is not healthy. And here's the other thing, what if we're allergic? What if it's introduced a new allergy to the area? It could have a really bad effect on human health as well. And what if it's like, so let's say you live in, a, um, in the Caribbean and you sell fruit. And in your area, you've got a wide variety of different kinds of fruit that you're growing. And so then you just like collect that fruit every day and you go to the market. But now let's say pineapples, somebody's come in and pineapples are taking over. I just read something about that, that planting pineapples on Maui back in the about 1800s was one of the factors that led to Maui being susceptible to fire issues. So let's say that somebody comes in and they're like, I like pineapples, and now the pineapples have grown out of control, and that person only has pineapples to bring to the market, but also everybody else only has pineapples. That's gonna affect their livelihood or the amount of money that they can make. So it can have, some of these introduced species, when they become predominant in an area, can have a really harsh effect also on the economy of that region. Just like the lionfish and the coral reefs, if the lionfish start to eat a variety of all the juvenile species, and the number of species in that area goes down, meaning that the number of other pretty fish, right, the lionfish were pretty, but all the other pretty fish go down, are we really gonna go over and over again to the same areas to just look at lionfish? Especially knowing that they could poke us, and if there's tons of them, and you're snorkeling or diving in that area, and you're like, oh, I don't wanna go back there, I might die, because I might get poked by a lionfish. So that also, in other ways, like ecotourism ways, can have an effect. If the coral reefs aren't looking so great, people aren't gonna go there either. So there's a wide variety of ways that these invasive species can have an effect on the economy of an area. And, you know, like I said about the lionfish poking you, it's poisonous. So it's another way it can have an effect on human health. So that's just one example of humans introducing an invasive species to an area can affect the structure of a community. So let's talk about other community interactions. One obvious one, the way that communities can interact, it can be positive and, and uh, you know, you might think of this as negative, but in a way it's positive because the lioness here eats a zebra, and maybe the zebra population, maybe they need the predation of the lions on the zebras because if the lions weren't eating the zebras, you could have just tons and tons and tons of zebras. One of the things that's been studied is fungus, that fungus are a way to control insects, that the whole insect group would be out of control if fungus didn't have this relationship of getting inside insects and actually taking over their bodies. That fungi keep insects in a balanced amount in ecosystems. So just like this, the lions might keep a zebra population at a certain number and keep everything in balance. I like this picture because it's like, this is attacking that, it's attacking that, it's attacking that. All right, so a little bit about biological community interactions. We're talking about, when we're talking about communities, we're focused on the living, having a relationship with the other living things. That's what community is. So we're directly taking out the abiotic factors, although we kind of know the abiotic factors influence populations, which influence communities, but we're just gonna look at the interactions of the living things with one another. And so some of those are we're gonna look at predation, parasitism, and mutualism, and we'll get to defining those in just a bit. Here's another thing to think about. Evolution's always kind of an underlying factor in biology. The way that one organism evolves or changes will influence the way another organism evolves or changes. So the term co-evolution means that 
when two species interact, they have natural selection influence on one another. They force each other to evolve. As one changes or evolves, the other adjusts and changes or evolves. Or one might evolve and it might cause the other one to go extinct or have a lower carrying capacity. So here's a really lovely picture of, here's a flower that's very long, and here's the hummingbird that gets nectar from this particular species. This beak fits precisely into that flower. So what we mean by this evolution is that, so we haven't gotten to evolution yet, but one of the big principles of evolution is that evolution is all by chance. It's based on mistakes in the copying of the DNA from a parent to their offspring, or from a sperm to um, a sperm and egg to their offspring. So if you have a chance when you're making sperm from the parent cells or you're making egg, that when they go through the process of meiosis to make sperm and eggs, the likelihood of having mistakes in the copying of the DNA from those parent cells to making the gametes or the sperm and egg, it's likely. The amount and volume of DNA that has to be copied, it's kind of like having 12 textbooks. So if you took like 12 textbooks and you stacked them on top of each other, inside of a cell, a little microscopic cell, they have to copy that volume of 12 textbooks to make the sperm and egg. They do it quickly. There are some checkpoints that monitor whether mistakes are made and try to correct them, but even with only, there's about three checkpoints, do you think mistakes would be made if, let's say you, I gave you the homework of, I want you to copy your textbook in full by Thursday. One, I don't think you're going to finish it unless you stayed up, I, still, even if you stayed up the whole time. But let's say you did finish it. Because you have that presser, pressure to do it quickly, do you think you would make a lot of mistakes? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's like the way that DNA from the parent cell to making sperm and egg that make offspring, that's what happens, is that you get a lot of mistakes that are made. When the copying happens, just like you, would you intentionally make mistakes? No, you're not intending to make mistakes, but because you're doing it quickly, you're gonna make mistakes. And you have this big volume, you're gonna make mistakes. And so by accident, when the parent cells copy the DNA to make the sperm and egg, by accident, mistakes are made in that copying of the DNA. What those mistakes equate to are changes in the genes, the alleles, the versions of the genes. So you can start to get within a trait, like let's say the length of a flower, there can be mistakes that are made. Let's say that these flowers originally were really short and that there were mistakes that were made that all of a sudden you have a really long flower. So now you've got two different alleles or versions of that gene. You've got short flower and you've got long flower. Now, in the hummingbird population, just simultaneously, they're doing their thing, right? They're reproducing, they're eating, etc. And maybe they had short beaks. And simultaneously, a mistake is made in this population where now they've got short beaks and they've got long beaks because of that mistake. And so within the population now, what you have is you have the ability of the short beaks to feed off of the short flowers and the long beaks to feed off of these new long flowers. And neither of these happens, like the birds don't look at and go, oh, this bird population who are all short beaks, they can't consciously say, oh, look it, some of these flowers are long, let's reduce the competition within our population and let's just force our DNA to make a new allele or version. You can't do that, right? Just like you can't think, when I have children, I'm going to will my sperm or egg to have the ability of my children to have wings. 
or guilt, right? Can you do that? Can you just consciously force your DNA to evolve? No, it's all by chance. So this evolving and this simultaneously evolving is all by chance. So as one changes, longer flower length, if by chance the other one changes, long beak, these two have a better relationship or ability to survive. That's evolution. So if you think about that, all of these by chance encounters over time have led to us. So kind of like we're a total mistake. Mutants, everybody's a mutant. So, you know, like those superhero films when they're like the mutants and everybody's discriminating against the mutants. It's like, I always laugh because I'm like, we're all major mutants. We're all tongue, so, you know, that's the life of a biologist. All right, so another example, we're gonna take a look at in here. So you've got the sea turtle and the slipper lobster populations. And when we're talking about this evolution or influences, the coevolution, we're talking about long periods of time. Evolution does not happen quickly. A lot of that depends too on your generation time, like bacteria, they can evolve quickly because they have very short generation times. These are a little bit longer, so these would take a long time. We're talking about hundreds to thousands of years for these coevolution factors to influence one another. So let's say we go back, 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 million years, and the sea turtles, they have a soft mouth like us, and the slipper lobsters are this squishy little creature. In the sea turtle population, there's a mutation that comes up, and some of the offspring have beak-like mouths. So now you've got these two things in the population. You've got one with a beak-like mouth, and you've got one with a soft mouth. So the beak-like mouth, they can chew through more things. Well, let's say like mollusks, for example, that have shells, that the ones with the beak mouth, they're more favored to eat a greater variety of food because they can bite through shells now. These, they both can eat pretty easily. The soft mouth and the beak mouth can eat the slipper lobsters because they have a soft body. But in the slipper lobster population, you have a mutation that just by chance pops up a mistake where they start to have this hard exo or outer skeleton. And so now with the sea turtles and their two alleles for mouth type, who has an easier time eating or biting through the exoskeleton of the new variety of slipper lobster? The beak or the soft? The beak, right? So now they have an advantage again, just like I said with the, the mollusks. But around the soft mouths, the slipper lobsters who have the hard shell, they can get bit and nothing happens to them. So they have an advantage on the other side, the coevolution there. So now let's say that the slipper lobsters, they have a mutation where they get really strong ab muscles. And in getting those strong ab muscles, the ones that have that mutation, when they go to get bit by the beak mouth sea turtles, they can go, as you saw in the video, and they can crunch their abs and they can fly away faster. So we have that back and forth over time. And again, it's all just by chance what pops up. That's co-evolution. Horses and grass, over time, you have grass. Grass eventually evolves a mutation for having a lot of fiber inside, and that fiber is harder to eat. So any horses that have a mutation of flat teeth, like our molars, molars are good for grinding, and what they can do is the fiber or the cellulose, they can grind that better and release the bonds. There's a lot of bonds in cellulose or fiber, and they can get more energy out of it. So favored are these flat teeth. There also may be a uh, there also may be a mutation that pops up for poison. So now you've got poisonous plants, and even though they can eat them easily because they've got the flat teeth and they're favored to get more nutrients, when they try and get those nutrients, they get poisoned. And what you may see over time is that you may have a mutation for a bacterium that lives in the stomach of the horses that can take that poison and make it something that's not poisonous, and you have that again back and forth. So we're gonna look at different types of community interactions here. We're going to talk about competition, predation, parasitism, 
and we'll get into mutualism. All right, so a little bit about competition. Inter-specific competition, so that inter is very critical. Inter means different species. So when we're talking about inter-specific competition, we're talking about members of different species competing for limited resources. Could be like in a population that there is like that grass that's right outside the window. It's very likely that a wide variety of species in our community eat that grass, not just one. So we have different species competing for the same resources within a community. That's inter-specific competition. When we're talking about competition, in general, competition hurts both participants. Right, remember, there's only one A in the class. You're all gonna fight for it. Just kidding, don't worry. Y'all can earn what you earn. But generally, when you have a competition, both members are harmed, even when you have a winner. What also happens is that competition reduces each other's access to limited resources. So let's say you're members of, the, of a species of bird, and you're the same general group, which we call genus, but you're different species within that group. You might have very similar, what we call niches, or needs within your community. So even though you're not the same species, but you're very close in the kind of species, you might have very, very similar needs and have a great deal of competition. So let's talk about how do species deal with this when you have very similar needs? What our needs are called in an ecosystem are the ecological niche. And the ecological niche, it includes every aspect of your life. What you eat, where you live, what kind of minerals and vitamins do you need to keep you healthy? Who are your predators? Who are your prey? Can you fight off certain kinds of protists and bacteria and viruses? What job do you do for the ecosystem? Like we know, for example, the photosynthesizers do the job of producing food. You could be some kind of like a, a mole, for example, and your job might be to make holes underneath the ground so you can allow airflow that gets to plants from underneath. So almost every species has an important role in an ecosystem to do. Okay, so niche includes all of the following. So I mentioned a bunch of them. The habitat or the physical home. Make a note, niche and habitat are not the same thing. Students often confuse niche with habitat, but habitat is a part of the niche. So you have the niche, every aspect of an um, organism's life and habitats within that. Habitat is only the home. The niche also includes all of your resources. What kind of food do you eat? What kind of, how much oxygen do you need? Every species has different oxygen needs. What kind of minerals do you need within your diet? What kind of other species do you need to help build your home? protect your offspring, so all of your resources. What kind of environmental needs do you have? How much water do you need? How, um, what temperature do you best live at? If you're a species who really can't take being in the heat, you're going to be like either underground or underneath like leaves and plant matter. You might live under a bush, as opposed to others who need to be out like the reptiles, they need to warm themselves to warm up their metabolism or to get their metabolism going. So they need to be out in the sun all day. What are your behaviors? How do you interact with your predators and your prey? How do you deal with other species who are competing for the same limited resources? What do you do to keep yourself going as a species? And what's your job? Do you help make holes underground? Do you photosynthesize? Do you uh, make nests up in trees? So everybody has different important things that they do in an ecosystem. All of these things are what we call the ecological niche. Generally, no two niches are exactly the same, even for the same species. So like you all, we're all the same species, right? Do we like and do all the same things? 
No, right? So there's an example, just think about how individuals do certain things in a certain way and like certain things or don't like certain things. So natural species are the same way, is that they're just like you and I, as they have different preferences. Do we all look exactly alike? No, we. I can tell you all apart. So we look different, which means that our predators may interact with us differently, as well as we may interact with our prey differently. We might have some that'll be very, 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 very similar though. Your base needs are similar, right? You, have a, you need a house, um, you need food. So we all have the basic needs that are the same. So let's talk about what happens when your needs are so similar and you as a species are unwilling to make a variety of different needs so that you can survive so that you and another species have a very, very, very similar ecological niche. What can happen is that one can force the other one by being evolved or adapted better, can force that one to die off, the other one to die off. So this is what we call the competitive exclusion principle. So think about what the words mean. Competitive, competing, right? Trying both, trying to get a limited resource. We know that competition, not a good thing for participants. Exclusion, one gets put aside, put down, left behind, they're excluded. So remember that competition will exclude one of the species competing for very similar niches. The one that is better adapted to the situation will outcompete, will be the winner, will harm the other species. The one that's not so good, not as well adapted, not have, doesn't have the best genetics in the situation, they may die out. So would you want to really do that? No, right? You figure out, most species figure out a way not to exclude one another because competition hurts you. So let's say we've got, in situation one here, you've got some birds and they're just like living in this whole tree, eating the bugs and the leaves. But then this other species, so maybe it's the same genus, different species, very similar niche, comes along and is like, wanna fight for the bugs or you wanna share the bugs? And so what happens in this situation is that the birds that are adapted, the yellow ones that are best adapted to living lower, will be like, okay, we'll go lower and we'll go higher. So we'll take the top and bottom of the tree and then you all, because you have maybe big, bigger, bigger talons or claws, you can hold on to the bark and you do better in the middle. How about we take this part and that part and you take this part. And then we don't fight. And we allow each other to have access to this limited resource of these bugs here. So it's kind of like sharing. That species are like, it's better to share than it is to exclude one another. So that's one way that they deal with it. But if they don't, what will happen is, for example, like a study was done on paramecium. So it's a single-celled protist. And they took them. And they grew them in separate glass containers, same size, put one species in one container, one species in the other container, gave them the same amount of food. So they got the same space, the same food, the same amount of water, and they let them just sit. And what they do, both did is both species, when they were separate, showed that exponential growth, that J-shaped curve, and then leveled out at the carrying capacity to show the S-shaped curve. And so they both did this nice, like, okay, we have nobody to compete with but ourselves, and eventually space gets less and food gets less, and they level off at a carrying capacity. But then they dump them into the same flask. And so now they're competing for space and food and water. And the one that is better at maybe reproducing earlier, having more offspring earlier, having more offspring at a time, maybe they start to show that J-shaped curve, and they start to level out, and the other one is like, ooh, wah. And they show that exponential growth, and then they show that bust. They show a boom and a bust. So here's the data that was collected on this experiment, that in separate flasks, they both showed that logistic or S-shaped curve. 
And note they both have some biotic potential, but environmental resistance kicks in here and they level off at the carrying capacity so that they can live for a long time as a species in a comfortable way at a certain level or a certain population number. But when you dump them into the same flask, the blue does this nice S-shaped curve. They level off at a carrying capacity, but they're better adapted for whatever reason to the situation and they level off and they're good for a long period of time at their carrying capacity. But red does show that exponential growth, but then they show a period of bust and eventually go extinct or die off in that situation. So this is better, right? Better when they're alone. But wouldn't it have been better if the red was like, hey, 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 can we share? Can we share this? Because that did not help them. This competition really hurt them. Evolution favors organisms that have less competition in their life. So the less competitors you have, what happened? Was it not good? How do organisms? Oh, is that copied again? No, no, it's just a lot of the Just in between. Uh, natural. Okay, so I think I copied. I copied the same thing. Oh, I think that's going to come next, maybe. I know you're just uh, one, two, three, like four, five lines down. Sorry about that. Let's we'll see if that part comes back. So fewer competitors. Natural selection favors organisms that have less competitors. One of the ways to do that is to specialize within your niche. So just like what we saw with the birds, is the birds, the yellow birds specialize with being low and high, and the red ones with the bigger talons could hold on to the bark better, and they specialize by having those better claws, and they can utilize the middle, and they share. I think now we come back to that top part. Okay, so um, here we have, let's, yeah, so now we're back at the top. I'm sorry about that. So go, now go back to the top part of the page. So how do organisms deal with this? They do it by sharing or what we call resource partitioning. So you have some limited resource and partition means a part of, think about it as sharing resources, resource sharing. Like the yellow and the red birds is instead of fighting for the whole tree, they shared and they, based on what genes or traits they had or specialized for using that tree, they shared those different parts based on their specializations. So everybody exists in a smaller niche than they normally would, right? Instead of having the whole tree, you only get parts of the tree, but that lowers your competition, then you don't have to compete as much. And it reduces the harm in competition. Take away the competition and share. And that's why most species will exist in the real world. Okay, now I'm sorry about that. Um, another thing to fix, always something to fix. So for example, these are different kinds of warblers. Warblers show a type two survivorship curve. They are migrators. So every day, a warbler is going from one area, they're flying a long way, they go to the next area, fly a long way, go to the next area. You never know what to expect. So they fly all day and they come to, let's say that they really like pine trees, evergreens gymnosperms. So they come to this tree and they're like, so let's say this one gets there first and is like, cool, I got the whole tree. Nobody else is here. But then this one comes along. And so they kind of negotiate like, well, I'll take the bottom half, you take the top half, and then we won't fight. We've had a long day of flying. Let's not fight. There's plenty to share. But then this one comes along. And then this one's like, well, I'm going to go to the bottom. You go to the middle. You go to the top. Then that one comes along. And then they all are like, well, it's all moved down a little bit. And then that one comes along. Oh, it's all moved down a little bit. And so that you could have as many as five different species who could all be fighting with one another over living in the tree for the night and eating the insects in the tree. But then they all take a little spot and share and reduce their competition. 
intra-specific competition. So see, this is different. Inter was different species. Intra is competition between members of the same species. So you're at the bottom now. Again, just like you and I, same species, but we have different ecological niches. That's what happens with members of the same species in a population is that they even will vary their needs so they don't compete with one another so much that they harm the total population growth. In general, when we're talking about competition, competition can have an effect on the size of a population, negatively or positively. Like you saw with the paramecium, between the two, who are very similar, not the same species in this case, but inter-specific competition, that the size of that red population and distribution went way down because they couldn't compete. All right, back to inter-specific competition because inter-specific competition is what we focus on in communities. So here again, when we're looking at an ecosystem, if we're looking at a tree, you have a lot of different species in a community that need to utilize this tree. So you're going to have some that utilize the roots and you can see a variety of them utilizing the roots and some will utilize the trunk and some will utilize the branches and the leaves. And so all of these different species are going to show research resource partitioning to lessen competition for this one limited resource of the tree. Predation. Predation, we talked about this a little bit. Predation is the act of killing and eating another organism. So even cows are predators on grass. They are killing and eating it. And we have all these different scenarios here. So if I just say predator, you might think of something like a bear or we just watched Cocaine Bear, so funny. <laughs> you might think of that bear or you might think of a shark. In general, what we find is predators are big or they hunt collectively. So like a pack of wolves, you might have a moose, which is huge, like twice the size of me, tall with their antlers. And you might have an, an elk or a moose that is hunted by a pack of wolves. The wolves are the greater predator in this case but they need to be together to take down that big giant animal. And usually we find that predators are less abundant than their prey, usually. So not in the case of maybe packs of wolves, but we might see less. And we all know, right, Jaws, the shark, the Meg, kills, flinging, like getting into a circle and actually throwing a seal or a sea lion to one another, playing catch. So. They're, they're just playing catch. All right, so what we're talking about is, again, coevolution here. So you've got the prey have to learn to avoid the predators. The predators have to have good habits to get the prey. So they're exerting that pressure on one another. They have to be better, better, better. So another example that you have below is a hawk and mice that over time you may have found that the hawk started out, didn't have great eyesight and the mice were maybe like, I'm just exaggerating, maybe like bright purple. So the hawk could be flying above and see the bright purple mice and the brown green grass and go, oh, there it is. The hawk have a mutation where they evolve better eyesight just as 
you have a mutation in the mouse population for having either light green or brown coloration. So they can blend in with the grasses. And so now the better eyesight can, of course, see the purple ones, but also then can see the movement of the green or the brown ones in the green and brown grass. So you have that back and forth. Another example that predators use, or I should say predators and prey use, are counteracting behaviors. Counteracting behaviors are behaviors that put pressure, cause competition, cause natural selection to be a force on each other. When we say a counteracting behavior, it can be one of three things that happens. It could be that they change their external, the way they look. So like a mouse going from like purple and brown being favored. So you have a change in how they look. It could be their internal physiology, like grasses becoming poisonous, or it could be some kind of behavior. Like when a mouse sees a hawk, what they know is that they get underneath the brown grass because they're brown in color and they blend in or camouflage and they hold really, really still. So their behavior for holding still is really important to not being spotted by hawks that have very good eyesight. So it could be any one of these three, how they look, how their internal physiology is, or how they act. Yeah, I'm gonna skip over that. So bats and moths, bats use sonar. They send out sound waves to feel where their prey or to kind of like see where their prey exists. What happens is these sound waves hit the world out there, bounces back, and it gives them a shape in their minds so that even, mat, uh, even bats who are blind or have very poor eyesight have the ability to kind of see by using sonar. Sonar, because it's a sound wave, the moths having very simple hearing, they can hear that something that we couldn't even hear. So if they hear that, they know, uh-oh, we better fly like erratically to try and avoid the bat because the bat's gonna think they've got, you know, like maybe a few seconds, throw out sonar, oh, the moth is there, now the moth's gonna fly over here. By the time the bat gets there, the moth is gone. Over time, what the moths can do is the moths produce clicks that also interfere with the sound waves. So they just start going in response to the so that when they get hit with that sonar, it breaks it up and it sends back a jumbled picture so that the bats are like, I, I don't know what's out there. I can't see because they've messed it up. But then the bats are like, wait a minute, I hear clicks. What if I stop sending out the sonar that's not working for me anyway and I just listen and I fly toward the clicking. So you see that back and forth, back and forth pressure. I love this example because it shows how clever species are in figuring out how to deal with one another. That could happen, so uh, camouflage. I mentioned before that if you are a species like a mouse who might get spotted by a hawk, and the hawk has really good eyesight, but you have good ability to blend in. Your ability to blend in is called camouflage. It makes you basically like invisible in your environment. Even though you're there, you blend in so that you're what we call inconspicuous or almost invisible in your environment. This would help both predator and prey in different situations. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Uh, so let's answer this question. Which behavioral response to the threat of predation is most likely to be selected for in a species that uses camouflage for protection from predators. Is it a quick escape response? A sudden display to startle the predator? Cooperative behavior? Behavior that mimics the behavior of the predator or motionless behavior? 
Good, yeah. So I was going, okay, hopefully they'll, since I said it, hopefully they will get that. So here are some examples of predator-prey relationships that would benefit from camouflage. And it could be that they are either the predator, and so think about like if you're a predator, there's a flat fish right here. So here's a fish, and there's its mouth and its tail, and it has the ability to blend in really well. That flat fish could use this in being a predator or prey, so being prey could just blend in and hold still and hope the predator doesn't see it. But as a predator, it could hold still, and then when prey swim by, it could just be like, and jump out. So it could benefit that animal both ways. There's also a frog here that the frog, its coloration blends in with dying leaves. So you can see the face here, and an arm, and a leg, another leg and another arm. And then the Arctic fox, for the majority of the year, it blends in with the snow. But during short growing seasons, one of the strategies that animals use is striping, that it could kind of like go into the branches and you could see like branches might have like some whiteness to them and some gray or that mottled color. And it could like go in the bushes and blend in with that striping. Um, zebras who have stripes all over them, that's actually a form of camouflage that when they're running, it makes them blurry and it makes them hard to see, especially when there's a whole group of them. It seems weird, but it does help them to blend in. So here's another example of a flatfish. I always like to say, like, you know, we think humans are so intelligent, yet to me, this is such an intelligence to be able to go from that natural environment and they took flatfish and they put them in artificial environments like this and I mean it's not perfect but that flatfish has never seen a checkerboard background but it does a pretty good job of figuring out what the background is and changing its coloration to blend in. So Camouflage, again, it's not just used by prey, but it's also used by predators. And, and I love that video because it shows you both sides of it within one species. Snakes have that coloration of their environment, but also have like striping, or you can see kind of like almost a triangular shape that breaks up their body pattern and allows them to blend in or camouflage better. Cheetahs, the spots on animals, it helps them to, again, break up the body pattern. So anytime you see those spots, like on a cheetah or a whale shark, it helps like to kind of like, where's the shape of this? I'm not sure. Also, the coloration helps them to blend in with grasses so that they can hide from predators, but also crunch down and do a sneak attack on their prey. This is a frogfish. Here's the outline. You can see the mouth here, and this is an eye, but these other dark spots, what they give you the idea is that this is a sponge with holes in it, but it's just dark spots on the surface. What benefits, they're very similar to lionfish, as I talked about before, that they have a really big mouth. They can grab their prey very quickly. And even though this looks like a big, fat, lazy fish, it can jump out, eat a prey, and be back in its place in a millisecond. So less than a second, so that other fish are like, wait, something happened, wait, oh, where did George go? He's gone, what happened? And this is what's called episiomatic coloration. What episiomatic coloration means is that you are like really bright in color, and your signal is a warning signal that says, I am either very poisonous or I taste really bad. 
So like this snake could just go around in the forest and be easily spotted. And it's almost like, ha ha, you can't eat me. I taste bad or I'm super poisonous. And same thing with these poison arrow frogs or dart frogs. They have really bright coloration against the green of the rainforest. Some of them, in terms of their counteracting behaviors, are mimics. And as a mimic, you are evolved to look like something else. Mimicry can be very simple or it can be very complex. So for example, you could be a cactus who has a certain coloration and shape that looks like rocks. So the cactus is here. And then these, well, there's two things in terms of the yellow, is that there's either real spines on this tree or some of them are what um, an insect called the Florida tree hopper. So if you're a bird and you're like, I know some of these are insects and some of these are spikes, are you gonna chance trying to eat one? Because that spike will go like right into your brain. So they're pretty safe having evolved to look like the spikes of a plant. Batesian warning mimicry is a type of mimicry where species have evolved to look like a poisonous species. So they are not poisonous, but they look like something that is poisonous. If you're a predator and you come upon a species like this, and you're like, oh shoot, one of these is poisonous and one isn't, and it's slithering around, and it's making a behavior where it's like got its head up and it's hissing at you, are you gonna go, wait, um, let me think, the different, one of these is poisonous, you're gonna just be like, I don't know, red, and blue, and black means get away, right? You're not gonna chance your knowledge of like, I know which one is poisonous and which one isn't, you're gonna sit there and try and figure it out, you're just gonna run away. Same thing with the monarch and the viceroy. Monarch butterflies, uh, they live on milkweed, and milkweed is poisonous. They incorporate that poison as caterpillars into their bodies so that they become poisonous as adults or butterflies. There's the viceroy, which looks similar. So if you're a bird, you're not going to be, and this especially when they're flapping, it'd be really hard. I even I was looking at a monarch in my garden. And I was like, wait, is that a monarch or a viceroy? And it kept flapping and it took me like two minutes for it to stop flapping and see that the viceroy would have this, but what I was looking at didn't have those lines there. So it's hard to differentiate. Malarian mimicry is when you're just, like I said before, you're poisonous and you show it by advertising really bright like those poison dart frogs or the coral king snake, where you're just like, I'm super poisonous. The lionfish with all those beautiful spines and bright colors. And aggressive mimicry is like the frogfish, where you've got a lot going on. You are blending in really well. You have quick movements. You can eat one meal like maybe a three-day meal in one bite. So like the frogfish, they can eat a third of their body size in one bite. Imagine if you're 150 pounds and you eat 50 pounds in one bite. That's impressive, right? I mean, we don't, I'm hoping you don't eat more than like a pound at a time or, but 50 pounds in one bite. And then there's advanced mimicry where some species who don't look anything like the other species figure out their behaviors and adapt their own behaviors to look or act similar to that other dangerous thing. So here we have an example of that situation. We have a jumping spider. They're very aggressive predators. And then you have a snowberry fly. Doesn't really look much like that, right? 
This is the back end of the snowberry fly. The snowberry fly tries to look a little bit like the jumping spider by turning around and putting its wings out. And when it puts its wings out, the color pattern looks like the legs of the spider. And even then you might be like, wait a minute. Jumping spiders, before they attack, they do these crazy dances. So the snowberry fly, what it's done is it turns around and then it does the dance. So that something's like, wait, is, is that, that, oh, and they're gonna run away. And then you have startle, startle coloration, which we call false eyes or eye spots. Usually these false eyes are on a part of the animal that's more expendable or could be like bit without major harm to the animal. So what I mean by that is like, here's the major central nervous system of the butterfly. I guess this is a moth of the moth. The eye spots here are on these back wings. The front wings are more important for flying. The back wings certainly help as like rudders to move them. But if they got bit right here, it wouldn't be as big of a deal as it, a front wing or the head getting bit. The butterfly larva, they have these eye spots on the tail as opposed to the other end, which is the head, where the major part of the central nervous system exists. And so if they get bit on the tail, not as big of a deal as getting your head bit off. The thing about these as well that helps with protection is that if you're a bird flying over either of these and you see this and this, it looks like two big eyes looking up at you. And usually if you have big eyes, it means that the animal below is big. So it gives the indication that something big is looking up at them and I probably shouldn't attack it. And then some animals as counteracting behaviors use chemicals. So snakes will use venom. Venom has chemicals in it which would, can paralyze their prey. This is so cool, the bombardier beetle, it's like a skunk but in a different way that it will give a spray. But what happens here is this, they have actually like three different sacs here that when they're getting ready to attack, the chemicals within the sacs and the tail combine. And when they combine, they make a chemical reaction that makes the three liquids turn into a boiling liquid. And then they can spray this boiling liquid onto their, whoever's trying to attack them. And then octopus, octopuses and their relatives squid, cuttlefish, will use ink. If something tries to attack them, they release ink, and then it starts to spread out in the water and it forms like a big messy cloud, and then they can swim away. So here, for example, like a dumb scuba diver is gonna play with this giant octopus, and the octopus is gonna shoot the ink out, and it starts to make this like smoke screen, smoke screen in the water so that they could swim away and this is blocked from its site. Plants and herbivores, as I mentioned before, in terms of predators, that an herbivore, something that kills and eats a plant, is technically a predator. And I mentioned some of these before, that herbivore, uh, sorry, plants have, oh, sorry, let me say, herbivory. Herbivory is the act of eating plants. By it is a form of predation. And I talked about before that plants have adaptations that help them to escape their predators. When I talked about the horse and the grass, that the grass has cellulose or fiber in it, makes it hard to eat, but also plants could have poison. Uh, the Florida tree hoppers are on that plant that has spikes on it. Cacti have spikes as well or milkweed is poisonous or distasteful to most other animals, except for the monarch has adaptations to take that poison in the milkweed and incorporate it into its body.
or sorry, excuse me, live with another organism, I should say. And typically what you find with these symbiotic relationships is that two species live with each other in a relationship for an extended period of time. And so it could be beneficial and kind of like nice, like what you saw with the cleaners and the fish, or it could be like the parasite. So symbiosis, since we're by definition saying that organisms live together for a long period of time, and a relationship could include or does include parasitism, but also includes mutualism, mutual, right? Both benefit from this situation. And then I, I mentioned commensalism. This is one that's like, if you go into the world of ecology, if you become an ecologist, it's a very like hot debate topic that commensalism is defined as one species benefits and the other one is hurt or harmed. And a lot of ecologists are like, no way, there's no way that one other species isn't helped or harmed. And then some ecologists are like, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, there's like no benefit to this other species. So um, it's kind of funny, you know, you'll go into different areas of your careers and people debate these little picky uni things. So let's talk first about parasitism. Parasites live in or on their hosts for a long period of time. They want to keep their host alive. They may weaken the host, but you generally find that parasites are going to try and just like live without being spotted. It doesn't always happen that way. Like ticks, for example, um, you might not even know a tick is there until maybe like you're just like, you know, like washing your hair and you feel like a bump and you're like, oh, ew, what is that? Somebody looks at it and they're like, oh, it's a tick, right? So you might not notice it for a week or two if you're just like washing your hair and you just don't happen to touch that one spot. It might go unnoticed for a while. Um, but uh, like tapeworms or roundworms, they could live in our bodies for years, tens of years, and go unnoticed. Oh, sorry. All right, so parasites are generally smaller and more numerous than their hosts. I've given you so many examples of these now. Even though viruses, viruses aren't a living thing, but they are kind of like a, in that parasite category because they do get into our bodies and then they make us do things like multiply them, but just kind of know they're not living things. And there's one known vertebrate species, the lamprey eel, that has all these little teeth and it'll suction onto a fish and eat off of that fish, much like a leech would do to us, for example. Then mutualism. Mutualism is when both species benefit. Mutual, there's mutual benefit. Typically, you're looking at an exchange of services for food, for shelter, and protection. So you'll see those three things kind of exchanged between the two different species. You saw that between the spider and the pitcher plant. Pitcher plant is giving food and a home. The spider is going to do some protection of the pitcher plant, but then also help with food as well. Then we have a, a combination where you have an example, we saw these cleaning fish, but then there's a mimic who's a parasite to the hosts or the fish that come to get cleaned. We know these fish, you saw the examples where the fish or the shrimp will jump on and they'll clean up. The mimic looks similar enough that when the fish pulls up to the cleaning station, it's not like, oh wait, that's a different one. There's a lot of different kinds of cleaners in the ocean. And this will like go and take like a chunk of skin as opposed to doing cleaning. So it mimics the cleaner, but is a parasite. 
The last thing I want to talk about are, in terms of communities, there are what we call keystone species. They're key to the survival or the health of the ecosystem. They're very important themselves, just could be one species in a community that is critical. The health of them is critical to all the other species in the community. If something happens to the keystone species, it can destroy that entire ecosystem. Elephants are an example of a keystone species out in the African savanna. Elephants will get rid of small saplings or trees so that a lot of species can grow out in the sun. And so there's not like just complete forest in the savanna. But the savanna goes from like grassy areas to having areas of trees, but not just dominated by trees. By having them clear away all of these saplings and not in these trees allows for a greater variety of grass type animal, grass type plants to grow and flowers as well. These are called Pizaster. It's a genus of a type of sea star. They grow on the west coast in cold waters. In 1969, an ecologist named Robert Payne, he decided, I'm going to get rid of these. There's just, you know, too many of them. And when he got rid of them, mussels started to explode, and it really limited the number of species that were in that area. And eventually, other ecologists were like, uh, Robert, I think we need to put these back, because when we had these, there was a lot of species diversity, and when you took them away, it, the species diversity went way down. So then they reintroduced them, and the ecosystem went back to being healthy. So what they found out was that these species of sea, sea stars were a keystone species.